Why doesn't anyone in the One Piece storyline ever die, except for this guy? The answer is that One Piece is a story about transformation, and death plays an integral part of that. In fact, whether it be physical or symbolic, One Piece actually features tons of deaths. It's just that we don't always see people's heads randomly exploding, and so some can be a little harder to notice. After death, there usually comes a rebirth, normally with some sort of upgrade, which helps the character achieve their goal. For example, Lucci returning in the story, but with an awakening. This is a metaphorical death, rebirth, and physical changes, as Lucci was in Cypherpol 9, but after failing his mission, he was hunted by the world government, after which he returned as an agent of CP0 with his power-up. Now, what has this got to do with Yokai, and what does this tell us about the Gorosei and Emu? Well, hit that sub button as only a small percentage of our viewers are actually subbed. And let's yokai straight into this. From the Bible to Journey to the West, death and rebirth is often used in myth to represent the archetypal nature of the sun, moon, and stars. The theme of the procession of the sun and stars is often reflected in media by characters and their story arcs, such as with Jesus, the son of God. Big Mum and Carmel are great examples of this in One Piece as they represent the Yule Festival, which entails the death and rebirth of the sun during the winter solstice. In real life, an example of this transformation in the human experience could be the change from a child into a teenager through the process of puberty. But what happens if the transformation is unsuccessful or too traumatic? Well, that's how demonic monsters are created, or in this case, yokai. This video demonstrates why yokai are one of the most central themes in the entire story, how they came to be, and what Oda has planned for the endgame of One Piece. Remember the shadows at Thriller Bark, or Kazumbo, the fire spirit summoned by Kanjiro? How about the Cypherpole cover page 522? Or even Onigashima? These are just some instances where Oda integrated yokai inspired elements into that narrative already. It's clear that Oda has drawn from yokai lore. For example, the Wano arc is a treasure trove of yokai references from Kaido's dragon form to Onimaru, to Tsukiyaki disguised as a Tengu guard in the road Poneglyphs. Yokai are phenomena from Japanese folklore, so it does make sense we'd see a load of yokai references in Japan-inspired Wano. Over the years, many different English words have been used as translations, such as monster, demon, spirit, or goblin, but the term yokai encompasses all of them, plus more. From Tengo to Kasuni, their stories are rich with symbolism and cultural significance, similar to One Piece itself. Yokai are most commonly created by trauma and or a tragic past. Think the stink monster from the movie Spirited Away, a spirit which is sick from pollution and as a result becomes a stinky demon. We can see this idea probably best illustrated in One Piece with Nico Robin. Robin's people and home were wiped out and now she wishes to continue the Will of O'Hara and its history of discovering and recording knowledge. Robin's peaceful life was shattered when the world government deemed the research on O'Hara a threat, fearing it could uncover secrets they wished remained hidden. In what became known as the O'Hara Incident, Robin witnessed the island's destruction at only eight years old, losing her mother and everything she loved. Now branded a fugitive as one of the last survivors of O'Hara, her journey became a solitary and dangerous one, marked by constant evasion and survival. To make matters even more tragic, her skills as an archaeologist made Robin an invaluable asset to powerful individuals who sought to read the Poneglyph. This is an intense amount of trauma for one person to take and will inevitably lead to someone's transformation. It's possible that this trauma resulted in Robin's change of form during her fight with Black Maria, where she turned into an actual demon. No explanation was given, but she grew horns, wings, and lots of spider-like arms, then proceeded to break Maria in two. This wild and destructive emotional change contrasts Robin's usually stoic demeanor, suggesting Robin was losing control and unleashing a deeper power. The point of Yokai and One Piece is to explore how characters transform under pressure, and the aftermath tells us if the person has changed for the better or worse, if they've succeeded in their transformation or been consumed by it. The most important point of Nika Robin's journey is that if she does the right thing by the end of the story, despite all the hardships she's faced, then she's a hero, and proof not every trauma victim will go on to cause more suffering, which is what was implied by Dofi's quote, 
kids who have never seen peace and kids who have never seen war have different value. If Robin can go through so much bad but come out good, then this can inspire others to rise above their demons and become enlightened. In other words, Robin represents hope. Hope that not everyone who is traumatized will become a yokai. Hope in humanity. This is the same hope instilled within the will of D, driving Joy Boy's dream until it is fulfilled. But what happens when the transformation doesn't result in a hero, but a demon instead? Is this what happened to Robin during Wano? Could it be that the Gorosei have been taken over by their transformations and are now demons? And was this Emu's plan all along? The opposite of a hero is a yokai. A good example of this is someone who has failed to fulfill their dream. Kaido is a Joy Boy candidate that, unlike Luffy, is heavily affected by his traumatic past, where he was subject to world government experimentation and persecution. Oda even made it a point to explain to us Kaido made multiple attempts at unaliving himself, truly highlighting the depths of Kaido's sorrow. This pain is reflected in the impoverished state Wano has become under Kaido's rule. Kaido's character is inspired by the yokai Kaido Maru. Kaido Maru is known as Oni Boy and is found in samurai stories matching the Red Scabbard's B plot we see in Wano. This yokai was said to be able to kill a boar by throwing a stone at age 8 and known to easily break the bonds that tried to imprison him. This is interesting as it reflects Kaido's imprisonment but also Odin's experience with the mountain deity. So, in a sense, we see Odin as a successful Joy Boy, Kaido as a failed Joy Boy, with both characters being born in the same year. One is a hero, the other is a failed hero, and now ravages the land with drought, famine, contamination, and oppression. This is explicitly demonstrated with Kaido's different emotional stages while he fights Luffy. An important detail Oda included is that during these emotional stages, Kaido managed six attacks referencing the Buddha, but never made the seventh. We see this also with Big Mum, who manages six out of the seven days of fasting in Elbath, both reflecting how Kaido and Big Mum did not complete their journey to becoming Joy Boy or a similar hero figure. Luffy, on the other hand, made all seven transformations and became godlike. Ultimately, Kaido failed in his attempt to become Joy Boy, and as a result, became a yokai of sorts. Because of this, Kaido was defeated by Joy Boy, thematically being sent from the heavens to the underworld to start his journey again. This was because, although Kaido had a strong will, he wasn't in line with his environment, thus not fit to fulfil the will of D. This is much like what Whitebeard says about Blackbeard not being the one Joy Boy's waiting. So, what about the Gorosei? Saturn arrived on Egghead as the yokai Ushi Oni through a summoning circle. Since then, Saturn has seemingly summoned the other members of the Gorosei to Egghead telepathically, followed by 1110, where we get our first proper look at the rest of the Gorosei's otherworldly forms. These forms were revealed to be as follows. Marcus Mars is revealed to be Itsumade, a bird-like yokai. This was anticipated by much of the community, particularly after seeing Mars's silhouette in chapter 1084. Walkery is stated to be a Hoki, a Chinese mythical creature most famous from the journey to the West. Saint Ethan Baron, aka Gandhi Gorosei, was called Bakotsu, meaning horse bones, which is a horse that was burned to death in a fire and became a vengeful spirit. And out of all of the yokai we've seen so far, this is one of the deeper references that's harder to find in general text. Lastly, we have the outlier of the group, which is Jew Peter as a sandworm. It's an outlier not only because sandworms aren't traditionally recognized as yokai, but because his name was the only one to be written in katakana. It's possible Oda was inspired here by the philosophy and themes of the expansive Dune universe and the infamous shadow worms on Arrakis, created by Frank Herbert. Fortunately, I'm a huge Dune nerd, and so I can elaborate a little more on the significance of sandworms in Dune and what Oda might be trying to get at. Out of all the Gorosei, we currently know the most about Saturn. Saturn is shown as an Ushi Oni, a yokai known to be a poisonous mania. In one myth from the Edo period, a lord shoots the Ushi Oni with a bow, resulting in his wife getting sick from a curse, echoing what we saw with Ginny during her flashback. Additionally, Gyuki is the name of an attack Zoro used to defeat T-Bone. Interestingly, despite having little information on the Gorosei, it appears Oda has suddenly woven in some background information into Saturn's character, which may help us put some puzzle pieces together. 
J. Garcia Saturn is a high level but unnatural Oshioni, developed by technology and secret knowledge, such as an understanding of awakenings or the true nature of devil fruits. Then finally, we have Black Maria as a lesser Oshioni, with a basic zone fruit which requires a supplement to change forms. What I think Oda is doing here is demonstrating the three levels of transformations. Black Maria at the bottom with a basic devil fruit, some technology and limited knowledge. Then Saturn a level above her with a more capable devil fruit that also grants him full control over his form without using rumble balls or any technology. And also, of course, a vast understanding of science and esoteric secrets. And finally, the demon of O'Hara, Robin, at the top, being an actual real yokai coming to life through her oppression and pain without needing any special trickery. This is why I think Oda showed us Sanji calling for her to sort of evoke this response. Also, this harkens back to the idea that if Robin can overcome her trauma, anyone can. I speculate that Saturn will be defeated by someone who can overcome his scientific ways that connects particularly to poison and sickness such as Chopper. Now moving on. Marcus Mars was predicted by many to be Itsumadi, and rightly so. According to its original myth, a terrible plague spread during the fall of 1334, and the suffering of the plague victims is what summoned the Itsumadi. They are said to fly over areas where there is suffering or death in general, as they feed off the suffering. Notably, Itsumadi was said to be defeated by an expert bowman who shot the yokai out of the sky, similar to other yokai we've seen, just not with the sky element involved. Considering the bird motif of this yokai and the style of the character looking like something off the moon murals we've seen, we may be able to assume this Gorosei member connects to Sky Pier. Okay, and on to the next. Warkuri is a giant boar with four tusks known as a hoki. This particular boar originated in Chinese mythology and is most commonly known as Feng Zhi. This type of boar appears in Journey to the West, named Boar King, as well as other myths also, and has been used to represent an ancient rain deity as well as the human connection to the natural world. It's worth noting as well, the design itself that Oda gave us features a pattern similar to what we see with Law, implying Warkuri might tie to the North Blue. Okay, so next we have Saint Ethan Baron, who is revealed to be the mythical creature Horse Ghost. In many versions of the myth, the horse was mistreated or abused, and the horse meets a tragic end, often involving fire or burning. Following his death, the spirit of the horse returns as a vengeful ghost, seeking revenge against those responsible for its suffering or unjust demise. In some versions of the myth, the vengeful spirit can be appeased or laid to rest through the acts of repentance, restitution, or ritualistic ceremonies performed by individuals seeking forgiveness or redemption, which sounds to me exactly like Zorro. And lastly, Jew Peter was shown to be a giant sandworm. The fact his name was written differently to the other Gorosei members and he does not reflect a typical Asian mythological creature may suggest Jew Peter is the Gorosei member most different from the others and additionally may mean he's from a different era. The sandworm as a symbol represents the desert of course and often acts as a protector of treasure. What I find most interesting here, however, is that this is the yokai we get that is closest to a serpent. The Gorosei were revealed to not be snakes or dragons, which is interesting, seeing as Joy Boy has so many connections to serpents, and serpents play a large role in the One Piece story also. So, with these huge new reveals, it leads us to ask, does Emu have any other forms? And even, did Joy Boy have any other forms? There are countless ties to serpents like I mentioned in One Piece, so maybe one of them could turn into a huge snake or a leviathan or a dragon. Is it possible Joy Boy's Will of D ties to these mysterious transformations? The answers may actually lie outside Marijua with other yokai. The Will of D is inherently tied to the theme of yokai in One Piece through its main feature, death and rebirth. It seems that if a character can fulfill their part of the Will of D, then they die smiling, as with Roger who inspired a whole generation to search for the One Piece. However, if they fail, then they die frowning like with Noland, and their messages become distorted as we see with Noland's Book of Lies. 
The Will of D was introduced in Drum Island alongside Korea and Hiraluk, and Hiraluk saw something in the West Blue that led him to sacrifice himself with a smile on his face at the end of the arc. Chopper now carries on his dream of finding the cure to everything as a member of the Straw Hat crew. Kuina died leaving Zoro with a dream to become the world's best swordsman, and he went on to become... Furthermore, Robin's entire people and home were wiped out, as I mentioned, and now she finds herself on the crew of the future Pirate King. Point is, despite the fact that some characters have trauma, not all characters become yokai, but instead seek a better future and become potentially heroes. Now, this is echoed in the most prominent case of death and rebirth in the entire story so far, which is the climactic scene in Wano where Luffy's heartbeat restarts and our protagonist is reborn as the Nika-esque Gear 5. What this rebirth will entail, we're yet to fully understand. However, we did see Luffy gain a godlike power where he can realize anything imaginable into existence. Oda was pretty explicit with this example and it pushes to the forefront of the story how the theme of death and rebirth are some of the most integral themes in storytelling and in One Piece. What it means in this instance is that Luffy has accepted his environment and his destiny and that all elements are in the right place at the right time. In other words, harmony. By doing so, Luffy gains a surreal power up and breaks down the boundaries of what's real and what's not, even for the reader. The main message here we can assume is you can do anything if you will it enough and if it's in line with the environment. On the contrary, we have Blackbeard, a D-Clan member that looks like he's on the way to becoming a monster. As I mentioned, traits and ideals can transform multiple times from generation to generation, such as with the Monkey family, who all have a strong desire for freedom, but each work for a different faction to achieve it. If Blackbeard has inherited Zebek's will in a twisted way, it may follow that Blackbeard is an inherited yokai in some sense. There's a small figure sitting in a strange position behind Whitebeard during this flashback that Marco brings up. The flashback reveals how Whitebeard and many others had a traumatic past since being made orphans by war. Sat in exactly the same position as Blackbeard when we saw his flashback panel under the moon, it appears though young Zebek is subtly hidden in the background. If this is true, then Zebek definitely also has a tragic past, which a lot of us assume anyway. He was first introduced as a silhouette, something we see with the Gorosei Yokai form. He had glowing red eyes, which is a common feature of characters described as monsters, for example with the Florian Triangle and Big Mutt. In the silhouette, we also see Rock's hair resembling Saturn in 1094. Rox is a member of the D-Clan, which could mean demon, another word for yokai. If Sebek could captain Kaido, Big Mum and others, then no doubt he was a top-tier combatant also. Through a war-torn past, it could be that Zebek was traumatized and held a grudge, leading to his transformation into a yokai also. That said, I personally speculate, ultimately, Zebek did the right thing at God Valley and was a morally good character, inspiring Hiraluk to martyr himself in Drum. It could be that Zebek was galvanized by the world government leading Blackbeard to inherit in wrong information and twist Zebek's goal to something darker. This demonstrates how even D-Clan members can be susceptible to trauma and can become yokai. We know that Joy Boy failed his dream from the apology to Poseidon, so maybe in some senses he also became a yokai. Okay, so speaking of other yokai, what if I told you just like Robin there are other yokai inspired characters that could even surpass the level of the Gorosei? As I mentioned a thousand times already, yokai are deeply tied to death and rebirth. It's a motif that appears across a range of myths and like in One Piece usually denotes a transformation to another stage or plane. Kuma's character is partly inspired from the yokai Onikuma. Onikuma is a black bear with white mark. They're much larger than normal bears and are known to be very reclusive, kind of similar to Kuma's character in the story. This yokai, like others, is created through trauma. Through the pain and suffering of losing Ginny, Kuma is recklessly coerced by Vegapunk, allowing his lineage factor to be weaponized. Kuma makes several transformations from slave to liberator to cyborg and back to slave again, each 
time taking on a new appearance and a different agenda. In his recent flashback, we actually saw he'd visited the locations that he'd eventually send the Straw Hats to during the time skip. The flashback demonstrates it was likely intentional that Kuma sent the Straw Hats to each of their respective places during the time skip, which in turn means Kuma played a pretty major part in each Straw Hat's own transformation, which could be Oda's idea for his redemption after becoming a warlord of the world government and allowing the pacifista to be made. This is because the Straw Hats are going to make it to Laughter and restore the world order, meaning Kuma's sacrifice did work out for the better. Overall, Kuma's character arc is very physical, resulting in him literally sacrificing his body to protect his daughter. That said, many cases of yokai death and rebirth within the One Piece story are pretty much entirely symbolic and don't actually have any effect on the narrative or story beat. One Piece often uses cover stories to express this, for example in Buggy's cover story when his crew mistakes their captain for dead and subsequently hold a funeral for him. He then returns to their surprise and rallies his crew, claiming victory over the locals, kind of. The point of this cover story is probably to illustrate a part of the ancient One Piece history, but within that, Buggy features going through his own transformation that allows him to complete his goal. This is a good depiction of a hero that completes the journey without actually affecting any narrative elements of the story. While these more subtle examples can be abstract, we can identify the transformation from what the character does after. This is the case with Useless Mid, or as some prefer to call him, Eustace Kid. Kid was living with the trauma of losing childhood friend Victoria. It led to his and Killer's hate for Udon Noodles. This was then personified in Wano by Kid escaping from Udon Prison. This is symbolic of a trial, and shortly after Kid faces another trial when he seeks out Shanks a second time. Kid fails this trial when he's utterly obliterated in one shot by Shanks, and we see as a consequence of the loss, Kid's ship Victoria is completely split in half, and the ship and the crew take a plunge into the sea. This imagery likely is showing Kid and Killer essentially being baptised, and the Victoria being split in half is Kid detaching from his traumatic past with Victoria. So here, we are likely seeing a character that was traumatised, had conflict with his trauma, and will return enlightened after overcoming it. This may be why his name is Kid, as in he returns as a man or potentially a reference to a baby goat, which is symbolic of sacrifice. Law could very well possibly display a similar pattern here, but with his own respective variation. On the other hand, what happens if trauma isn't dealt with? Well, you can never achieve your dream, and your dreams become nightmares, turning you into a demon. Kaido was set on becoming Joy Boy, resulting in the suffering of an entire nation. When her hunger isn't satisfied, Big Mom becomes possessed and turns into the so-called God of Destruction. Noland never found the Golden City again and subsequently was executed. As you can see, in One Piece, an unfulfilled will doesn't usually end well. Big Mum's a great example of a demonic transformation. When it comes to childhood trauma, none stand out quite like her. With Lin Lin, we see all the standard tropes Oda uses to depict a monster or demon from a younger age. Traumatic childhood, silhouette, red eyes and even the animalistic teeth. She has all the features that make up a yokai here. She's also referred to as the god of destruction and is clearly not your average human in size or in temper. If Big Mum survived her lather bath in Wano, as many expect, then this would be a monstrous feat, indicative of a deeper power, similar to how I mentioned about Robin. Her penchant for eating people and stealing life is a feature of yokai also, and she was on a pirate crew described as monstrous. Big Mum also has ties to the yokai Tsuko Mogam, which are inanimate objects that have a lifespan, often based around 100 years. The trauma a yokai goes through is what makes them so powerful, for example like we see with Big Mum. It often makes them dangerous, and so it might follow that the worse someone's past is in One Piece, the more of a threat they are to the One Piece world in some way. Son of Garp, but with opposing ideals, Dragon leads the revolutionary army. Garp, Sengoku, and Suru all joined the Marines the same year, and one year later, Dragon was born. At age 17, the God Valley incident happened involving Garp. At age 33, the O'Hara incident occurred and again involved Garp, who refused to call the Buster call in. The following year, Dragon creates the revolutionary army, suggesting the tragic O'Hara incident was a catalyst for change inside Dragon. It would make sense for the destruction of O'Hara to take a heavy toll on Dragon, as we can assume he's connected to O'Hara through the physical resemblances shared between Luffy, Ace, Robin, and the current children on the island. And let's not forget, Dragon went to O'Hara to pay his respects, taking flowers with him. Dragon is partly inspired by Sotoku Tenno, 
one of the three most famous yokai to ever haunt Japan. After he died, he transformed, bringing about his wrath upon the imperial government. It was an open secret that he was the true son of Emperor Shirakawa. This fits Dragon's character through his interesting name, made up of both the name of the protagonists, Monkey, and antagonists, Dragons, as in Celestial Dragon. Both figures are known to cause rebellion and can be seen as leaders standing for strong ideals. Not only this, but the yokai is often surrounded by storms, cloudy skies, and lightning. Whatever Dragon's mysterious past is, we can assume it wasn't pleasant and that it shapes him and his agenda to this day. There's only one other character as significant as Dragon when it comes to traumatic pasts of the One Piece world. This is potentially Emu. Emu has been speculated to represent an Umi Bozu since the initial yokai reveal. Emu backwards is Umi, meaning sea or mother of sea, and Bozu is said to be a sea spirit or demon that resembles a giant human figure with an inky body and a big pair of eyes. They have also been described as ghostly and serpent-like, and are tied to ship meeting a tragic demise. Furthermore, they're tied to religion, and often said to be drowned priests or monks, which we kind of get a bit of with the other person we saw in Emu's flower room looking like a nun. Speaking of which, alternatively, Oda may have drawn inspiration from the Yawa Bakuni, who is a nun that lived for 800 years while still maintaining their youth. This extended life was granted after the nun ate a human-fish hybrid from an undersea world possibly tying to the fishmen of Wampi. She was said to retire into a cave where she prayed day and night to be freed of her extended life for so long she eventually turned into stone. Okay, so after all that, in conclusion, we can be sure yokai play an important role in One Piece from the demonic imagery present throughout the story. Going back through the story, we find many references that line up with the underworld and demons and the Straw Hats each individually have their own trauma. That said, they seem to deal with it quite well and develop as people shown through their personal journeys. During this story, this can be seen with Frankie when he tries to stop the sea train only to fail and rebuild himself as a cyborg. This example shares the main elements of a yokai transformation as we have an individual who goes through great trauma, metaphorically dies, and then is reborn with a chip on their shoulder. With the Straw Hats, the chip on the shoulder is the drive to fulfill their dormant role within the Will of D, which is a positive and heroic goal. This goal may have been passed down generationally, but we're yet to know for sure. This is opposed to causing suffering, which would be an evil or demonic goal. Inherited will is deeply tied to this cycle also, as it represents how dreams and hope are passed down over time in the real world. Like the self, if a character fails to develop properly, this can be problematic. The creation of a yokai simply put is someone who is stuck in their cycle by the choices they've made. These are often characters that are preoccupied trying to conquer their environment. This is opposed to Luffy, who only wishes to pursue what's inside himself, his dream to reach laughter. If Luffy can stay focused and not compromise his dream, then he and the Straw Hats will make it to Laugh Tale and achieve their dreams. So there you have it. Thank you for watching, fellow pirates. The intriguing connection between Yokai and the One Piece world is a deep rabbit hole. So thank you for joining me. And if you did like it, make sure to, you know, give it a like or a share. If you're not subbed, make sure you're subbed for more theories from Dendan Kushi, aiming for mostly Thursdays and Mondays at the moment. If you have made it this far, you've just managed to win yourself a free island whale, which Dill will deliver personally to your house. So make sure you let us know where you want it delivered. Other than that, keep sailing towards the truth, stroke a cat, be nice to your neighbors, and bye.